Welcome back, everyone, from lunch. I will introduce uh, the session, the first session in the afternoon, which is Case Studies, Engineering, and Disability Rights. And for this session, uh, Pilar Osario, who is a professor of law and bioethics at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, and bioethics scholar in residence at the bioethics program lead at the uh, Moorage Institute for Research. She's also the co-director of the program of neuroscience and law at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and directs the University of Wisconsin's ethics and consulta consultation service. Again, these bios are <laughs> pretty dense because that's how illustrious our speakers are. Uh, Pilar will moderate this session and in this session we have the pleasure of having Matthew Portis, but we also have Rosemary Garland Thompson who is uh, coming to us from the University of Pittsburgh through Oh, there she is. Hi. <laughs> the wonders of technology. Uh, so with that, and since technology is actually working today, I will uh, have Pilar come to the podium and uh, start the session. Thank you. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful um, event and for inviting me to be part of it. So this morning we heard um, that CRISPR-Cas technology has been adopted very rapidly, at least in the research community. Um, it's used in plants, animals, and humans. It's being modified by researchers around the world to um, be used for many specialized applications. Um, and I was happy to hear actually this morning that there was discussion of um, international governance and how do we make that happen. Um, and so I think we also heard that, you know, ethical, legal, and social issues are being raised and perhaps with new urgency because the scientific and science policy community view many types of interventions on humans as now becoming feasible in the near future when perhaps before they were more theoretical. Um, so CRISPR-Cas gene editing makes it relatively, and I say relatively, easy, cheap, um, and fast to make better targeted uh, genetic modifications than we've been able to do in the past. So they're better targeted, but of course, one of the ethical and regulatory issues that we're still grappling with in using this technology as a therapy in humans is um, dealing with uh, off-target effects, um, how to minimize those, how to identify them and minimize them if you're gonna actually use the technology as a therapy in humans. Um, setting that aside, I think, um, you know, it's just important to recognize how rapidly uh, this has become a very widespread technology, particularly in the research community. Um, but even, you know, there's a lot of public imagination about this technology. There are people who have purported to engage in uh, do-it-yourself gene editing, who have engaged in attempts to biohack themselves with gene editing uh, materials, let's say. Whether they effectively gene edited anything is a whole other question. <laughs> um, I have no idea. But um, today, we're primarily talking about gene editing of humans, right? As I think there was a previous event that talked about uh, maybe gene editing in crops and so forth. Today, we're talking about humans. And as Dr. Uh, Royal noted earlier this morning, uh, Gene editing in humans raises numerous ethical and social and legal issues, some of which have been addressed in the past. They're not all new. And in particular, during the 1990s gene therapy era, or what I like to call gene transfer era, which was really my introduction to bioethics as a, like a baby bioethicist. Um, during that time, a lot of issues were raised. A lot of issues were deeply analyzed. We still have many issues that have not been fully or adequately analyzed. Um, and of course, there are certain things that capture the imagination, but there are many, it's important to understand, I think, that there are many ethical and regulatory um, ways of addressing gene editing, especially somatic cell gene editing in humans. It's not like we have to recreate the wheel. It, it's not like we have nothing in terms of ethics and regulation. So a lot of it is not particularly sexy, um, for instance, we have ethical and regulatory frameworks for uh, when it is acceptable to do first in human trials of new technologies. 
uh, Dr. Kimmelman, who spoke this morning, has really pioneered some of the ethics work uh, regarding first in human trials. We already have those frameworks. We need to think deeply about how to apply them, the sort of details about applying them to somatic cell gene editing. But we have the ethical frameworks there. We have the regulatory frameworks there. Um, when we start talking, so, you know, thinking about gene editing, we've heard the terms this morning, somatic cell gene editing and um, germline gene editing. So just to refresh people's memory, right, somatic cell gene editing is done uh, with the intention of modifying only the particular individual who's being edited and not to have that uh, genetic event passed down to future generations. Um, germline editing is done with the intention of modifying an oocyte, sperm, or early embryo with the intention that the modification would be passed down through a lineage to future generations, right? So when we think about um, germline editing, I think it raises some issues that we, um, that have been discussed and analyzed, especially in the 1990s, but we haven't really had to grapple with those issues that much um, because um, making intentional genetic modifications to future generations was not really feasible until perhaps now or in the near future. Um, so, um, what are some of those issues, right? Well, we think about um, how do we balance risk to people in the near future, right, the next generation versus risk to people in the far future. Do we need to do some kind of balancing of that sort? What do we owe to people who don't actually exist? Do we have obligations to them? How can we have obligations to them, especially if what we do might change who is born? Right, that's a, a logical problem. Um, how will changing who, who exists in the future change the nature of society? Those are very large social questions and we haven't really had to address them in any serious way before. Um, and whether we're talking about somatic or heritable gene editing, um, you know, we have some questions like, to what extent do we expect or should we expect that people conform to pretty narrow institutionally defined norms of behaviors and abilities, rather, um, in, or in, as an alternative, should we expect that our, ins and even demand that our institutions and norms conform to a wider range of variation among humans? Would gene editing be used to narrow the range of variation or to expand the range of variation? And in what ways, right? Because just um, as we might use gene editing to narrow the range of variation with respect to certain, uh, you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms that lead to disease, people might potentially use it to expand human variation in other ways. So how, what should we demand of society and our institutions in terms of conforming to the range of human variation? How does that change if we're intentionally creating that variation or limiting that variation? Um, and I think that discussion this morning highlighted the fact that um, gene editing comes into a social context in which people all over the world are doing this. It is unlike the 1990s when um, gene transfer was a technology that not too many people in not too many countries really could realistically um, undertake. But now, gene editing is something that people all, all over the world are already doing. So we have different um, national imaginations and priorities. We have different cultural um, concerns and considerations about what kinds of human variation we value or don't value. So um, this really does raise a lot of, of issues about negotiating governance across national boundaries because it's pretty clear, for instance, from what we heard this morning, that what happens in China can have an effect on how people in the United States understand the technology and its risks and benefits, um, might affect how funding for gene editing goes or the receptivity of the public for gene editing. So these are things that, as we heard this morning, a lot of people are actually working on. Um, and I've been involved in a little bit of that work. But I think it's, it's, that's a discussion that we can continue on 
um, maybe in this panel um, and into our afternoon, our afternoon panel. So today we have two speakers for this panel. As we heard, Dr. Matthew Porteous, who is a professor at Stanford University. He's in the Department of Pediatrics and the Institute for Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine and also in the Maternal and Child Research Institute at Stanford. Um, and he was a member um, of the National Academy of Science, uh, Engineering, and Medicine Committee that studied issues related to governance of gene editing and put out a report that has been referenced by several people this morning, including Dr. Bonham. Um, and so he's going to be talking today about the current technical limitations um, on doing germline editing. So this morning, I think even though most of the panelists were talking about germline, or I mean talking about somatic editing, still there was a lot of, I think, uh, conversation. There were a lot of questions about germline. So Dr. Portis is going to talk about germline. And then I'm also just going to say a little bit more about uh, Rosemary um, at this moment, too. So as you heard, she's our second speaker. She will be coming to us from uh, remotely. And she's actually a professor of English and bioethics at Emory University, where she teaches and works in disability studies, and particularly on questions of justice related to disability. She also teaches American literature and culture, bioethics, and she works in fem and teaches in feminist theory. And she's going to speak on the sort of core topic of this session, uh, which has to do with disability rights. And I think this morning we heard some questions around justice and access to the technology. You might this afternoon hear perhaps a different vision of, of the concept, a different conception of justice relating to disabilities. Thanks. Thank you, Pilar, for that introduction. Thank you to the organizers for putting this uh, really outstanding uh, day together. Um, thank you to my prior speakers this morning who did a lot of the legwork setting up uh, what we're going to talk about this afternoon. And finally, thank you uh, all for being here. It's clear that this is an audience that's engaged and, and is asking immediately, I think, the insightful and incisive questions that we're all uh, grappling with. Um, so what I'm going to try to do over the next 20 minutes is use somatic cell editing and our advances in somatic cell editing um, to treat diseases like sickle cell disease as a way of highlighting the challenges we're going to have to do germline inheritable editing. And I'm going to actually start with the criteria that the committee that uh, Pilar just mentioned that I was on in terms of what might be required before one would proceed to germline or heritable editing. I realize I left heritable out of my title because I think heritable is the key feature here, not so much germline. So uh, as, as was mentioned, while many of the issues uh, that we're all very interested in and want to grapple with have been around for 20, 30, or 40 years or more, the reality is, is the CRISPR-Cas9 system gave a level of precision to modifying the genome that was unprecedented and uh, was highly active, as was discussed before, and raised the possibility that once what was considered infeasible was now feasible. And in fact, the quick application of the Cas9 system, and again, I think it's better called Cas9 because that's the scissors. We don't actually use the clustered, regular, interspersed palindromic repeats in anything we do. But CRISPR is such a cool name that we all use that. But the Cas <laughs> it's really Cas9. That's our, our, our enzyme. Um, quickly was applied to make genetically modified organisms, and again, it was highlighted today how many organisms within a couple of years of the discovery of the te technology was raised, including a publication uh, showing that modifications of human tripronuclear tri uh, zygotes was possible, although that, uh, in th th those, those publications actually highlighted the, uh, uh, the limits to it. So out of this came a, a call to have um, the National Academies put together a, a study committee um, along with the Royal Society. And I think for the first time, and, and Pilar will probably correct me, was the first time a formal committee actually said there might be a path forward for uh, heritable or germline entity. I think prior was really considered uh, off limits because of the lack of specificity. And listed here are a number, are all the criteria that we developed, and the, and the report is available online. And I'm not going to read through all of these because they're available. Now, just before, but I am going to split them into two different categories. Um, I just want to point out that this was a relatively large committee for the National Academies. They tell me they usually like to have committees about half this size. 
But given the need to have uh, uh, stakeholders from a wide range of countries, and you can read here, the, actually it's not listed their countries, but they came, I think, from all the continents that people live on other than Antarctic, um, and a wide range of fields, including lawyers and bioethicists and scientists and uh, human geneticists. Um, and out of this, I think, pretty good committee, it's obviously not a perfect committee, um, came these criteria. And the key social and governance criteria, I best, best paraphrase as no secrecy, um, that whatever goes on, if you're gonna do this, you should be transparent about it, you should be public about it, you should disclose it, and you should engage the public about what you wanna do. Um, so, and I don't wanna minimize these, because um, they're really important, but I'm a, I'm a scientist, so I'm gonna focus now a little bit more on the technical criteria. And there were several different technical criteria, some of which have been touched upon earlier today. The first was is that there would be no reason to do heritable germline editing if one could have a genetically related child um, through other methods, a healthy genetically related child through other methods. And those other methods could include in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or it might actually mean if we develop real good somatic cell therapy, there would be no need to then create, an, uh, 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 to use this method, and there would be then no reason to cross uh, that Rubicon. Um, I personally believe um, that using editing to increase the number of impl potentially implantable embryos is not a compelling rationale to cross this Rubicon. I also think technically it's not likely to increase the frequency because you're putting embryos through a manipulation and thereby increasing the chance they'll be un inviable. I think it's possible, um, so in the uh, United Kingdom on the National Health Service, uh, Pre-implantation IVF with PGD is available and paid for uh, for couples that are at risk of having uh, children with genetic diseases as long as you meet the list that they've pre-approved. And I think that has uh, interesting regulatory consequences and it, ha I mean, it prevents suffering because you're not bringing children into the world uh, with genetic diseases. And as, uh, as I wrote on the slide, it has the side effect of being economically cost-effective. The second technical criteria is it should be restricted to serious diseases or conditions and to genes with clearly proven causality. And the extension of that was is that uh, the committee said you, can, you should only be able to take a variant and change it back to a nucleotide sequence that is present and common and healthy in the human population. And so what that means is, is that you can take pathologic sequences and revert them to normal sequences but it, what it also means is you don't take patho, uh, healthy sequences or even pathologic sequences and introduce new sequences that have is never been in the human genome before. And I would actually argue sh even shouldn't be people, and here's where Karen and I had a little discussion at lunch, is if you can find a few patients in the world with a certain variant, does that truly mean that that variant is healthy or do I believe that the gene's there for a reason and there's probably a healthy function that it's there for and we can have a discussion about that. So with that as a background about, okay, we need, if we believe in these criteria, we have to figure out a way of reverting simply to a normal sequence. What is the challenge in doing that? And the challenges can be listed, or some of the challenges can be listed here. We need to make sure that the process is specific we need to make sure that we don't create a chimeric uh, embryo or human. We want to figure out how to generate only those common and healthy sequences. And I want to propose, actually, that zygote editing may not be the solution to these problems, but instead, what we may end up seeing, if this ever uh, does become widespread, is editing will occur at a stem cell stage or at a primordial uh, pluripotent stage and you will gen then generate sperm or eggs that will then create a human by standard IVF. So let me first rule out this pathway. So the standard way of doing genome editing is to design a nuclease that makes a break. We discussed that the Cas9 system has really democratized and revolutionized the field because of its ease of use and because of its activity. And when you make a break, it can be repaired by the cell in a mutagenic fashion, creating, creating genes that are now inactivated. And again, we, we heard some discussion this morning about how that might be used in somatic cells. But almost by definition, those new indels are, are sequences that have never been seen in the human population. They may mimic 
mutations that have been seen in the human population, but they are not identical to the sequences that are seen in human populations. So to think about doing this in the germline, then we really need to harness the other pathway that one might uh, use genome editing, which is the homologous recombination pathway or homology-directed repair pathway. And in this pathway, you initiate the process exactly the same way with an engineered nuclease that makes a break in the target site uh, you, uh, you want to modify. And then you provide a donor DNA um, that serves to uh, repair that break, and you can introduce exactly the uh, sequence uh, changes that you want to make. So you have both spatial and nucleotide precision. Now, before I go into how this has been developed, it was again mentioned earlier today that there are now a number of different genome editing systems that are not based on making a double-stranded break. And it's possible in the future that as these systems get more and more developed, they will actually solve some of the problems that I'm going to say in a, that currently exist in nuclease-based systems. So I'm going to focus on the system that we um, have found to, has found to be most active in an ex vivo setting. Um, and that's to purify our cell of interest, to deliver the Cas9 guide RNA, the GPS, uh, as a protein RNA complex, and then follow that by delivering the donor vector on a virus. And I won't go into a lot of the reasons, but what we found is, is using this system, we can introduce the genome editing machinery in a way that doesn't perturb the cellular function significantly. We've applied, we're applying that to sickle cell disease, as, uh, uh, as Vince Bonham mentioned earlier today, um, this is a disease caused by a single nucleotide variant in the beta globin gene, uh, leading to a single nucle uh, amino acid change in a protein, causing red blood cells to sickle, but leading to a multi-systemic disease. And the median lifespan, as was mentioned early, earlier, has not changed in the United States over the last three decades. But the median lifespan for patients in Africa, where we estimate there may be 200,000 births per year, is in the first decade of life. So using the RMP AEV6 system, we're now in the blood stem cells from sickle cell disease patients, we're able to correct the mutation in up to 60 to 70% of the alleles. So frequency far above what's thought to be therapeutically uh, necessary of about 15%. So we are now um, trying to take this system and move it from the laboratory into the clinic. And if in the Q&A you're interested in, more, in our challenges in that, I can say, uh, we can talk about it more, but maybe I can quickly summarize that that process probably costs $10 million to do in a lean academic environment and would cost even more if you were doing it uh, in a biotech or pharmaceutical. Now, even though we're able to correct a large number of the genes, in the process of correcting some of these genes, we break the other allele. And so, oh, and let me just go back. In the, to achieve this level of correction, we, we correct the underlying mutation, but we also introduce silent changes to facilitate that high correction frequency. And so what I'll point out is those silent changes are not present in the human population and therefore would not be uh, permissible under what the criteria I just said. Moreover, 70% of the cells have at least one allele with the non-homologous end joining sequence. And so again, that's not a sequence we'd want to introduce in the germline. And what's shown in the data here is within the population of cells, it's highly chimeric. So some cells have both alleles modified, some cells have one allele modified, some cells have two alleles modified by insertions and deletions. So this issue of chimerism is really important. So what about specificity? So one way of thinking about specificity is, is that the, you're more likely to get uh, a highly specific reaction if you don't have the nuclease around for a long time. So having it come in, do its job, and go away is one way of increasing specificity. And that uh, has been shown by a number of different labs. Um, but uh, the example I like to use um, was from Andy May's group, in which he showed that a guide RNA that was targeting a gene involved in a hereditary bone marrow failure, a rare hereditary bone marrow failure syndrome, looked very nonspecific in a test tube but when we used the RMP system that I just described to you, it was completely specific. There were no off -tar detectable off-target indels. But people want to get even better, and so then the second strategy uh, beyond just uh, um, using an RMP was to 
uh, improve the biochemical properties of the Cas9 protein, and we got to collaborate with a, a company, and we were able to show that this high fidelity Cas9 improved the specificity of our uh, process by over tenfold. So our, we reduced our off-target indels uh, so that they only occurred at one site in the genome and at a frequency of about 1% or less. I'll put in, into context that um, our genome is not sacrosanct, it does not stay stable, and that everyone's genome in this room is different, and I will say thankfully, uh, diversity is strength and diversity gives us robustness. But moreover, our genome, every single cell in our body has a different genome than this, its neighboring cell because there is ongoing mutations that occur in every cell every day. Some of us fly on airplanes and we probably shouldn't do that, uh, according uh, if we want to not all drown. Um, but that just exposure to the ionizing radiation is creating a burden of mutations. And so I'll argue that um, I think that high fidelity ex vivo arm paste genome editing is safer than bacon, meaning that we expose ourselves to mutagens all the time. And that if you sort of calculate how specific our RMP is compared to what we do, it's actually much more specific than uh, what we do standardly. Now, how efficient is this RMP AV6 system in zygotes? So it's, of course, it has not been used in human cells or published in human cells. I think it is being tested. But in mouse cells, it's a highly efficient system uh, in terms of creating targeted mutations, but it still results in chimerism. So what you end up with is a mouse that has a fraction of the animal has the changes you want, but another fraction of the animal has changes that you don't want. And so again, this is not efficient enough as it stands to think about applying it uh, to the human population. So what I mentioned earlier, I don't think actually zygote editing is the way uh, that this is ever going to really work. And the reason I believe that is if you the way you're going to do zygote editing is you'll inject either at the one cell or two cell stage, you'll let that cell grow into a blastocyst, you'll pluck one or two cells, you'll analyze the genome of those one or two cells, but we know that those one or two cells don't predict what's going on in the six or seven cells that you leave behind. And I just can't get my head around how you would solve this technical challenge. But I think you can get around this technical challenge by thinking about modifying a stem cell which you could then purify, do whole genome sequencing to assure that you've got only what you want, and then derive your, prim your, your, your sperm and eggs from those prim primordial stem cells. So for the sperm, you could think about modifying spermatogonial stem cells. For egg, you could think about uh, modifying an IPS cell and then differentiating it into eggs. And, um, I won't show you the data, but the uh, ability to turn IPS cells into true eggs has been done in mice by groups in Japan. And I'm going to show you the data and um, that uh, being able to edit spermatogonial stem cells has also been done uh, in mice. So again, the RMP AV6 system works very well in IPS cells, um, and we can achieve up to 60 percent biallelic gene correction in iPS cells, which means identifying a clone that had both alleles corrected would be a relatively simple process. Now, in terms of editing mouse spermatogonial stem cells, that has been done both with zinc finger nucleases, which we did several years ago, and more recently with the Cas9 system, and again, quite efficiently. So in the last couple minutes, I just want to uh, summarize some personal conclusions. And in the last slide, I'm going to actually throw out a, I won't call it a straw man, a proposal that you guys can shoot down about how this translational path forward um, might work. So the first is, is that there are only a very few examples in which heritable or germline editing it would be needed to prevent a child from being born with a serious disease. Uh, Kieran actually outlined one such couple, uh, a mom who has uh, both alleles having an autosomal dominant. But this is still uh, a very few number of people. As a pediatrician who takes care of it, N of one uh, diseases, though, I don't think this is a reason not to do it. Um, I think the idea of restricting edits to sequences that are known to be common and healthy protects us from having leakage into applications that don't address disease. There's no reason, basically, you're just going to do it to make lots of normal people. It also limits our hubris in terms of thinking, well, we're smarter than evolution. I'm going to create this variant in the human population because I think I'm smarter than what human evolution and human genetics has showed us. 
And I think you could use the UK uh, national healthcare system to say, to generate a list of sequences that you could edit to and say, these are the this is the permissible list. There obviously has to be quantitative public disclosures and international review, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, you want to do it in a non-chimeric way. And, but I think that some of the technical solutions that I, uh, uh, technical problems I outlined can be solved bet be between the advances in stem cell biology, germ cell biology, and the new and somatic cell editing. Um, and so I think if we hide behind the technical limitations, um, we actually aren't forward thinking about, well, when this is technically feasible, is this something we should do and how should we do that? And while I have focused on the technical concerns, I do not want to leave you with the impression that I don't think the societal, ethical, governance issues are not important. They are probably even more important because the technical issues, as I said, probably can be solved. So here's my, uh, I, again, I'm not going to call it a straw man proposal because it might be a real proposal, is I think the translational path forward is that a large, diverse international committee consisting of a lot of different people is uh, convened to regulate uh, germline head, uh, germline editing to create pregnancies worldwide, not to regulate germline editing for research or somatic cell editing. These, this committee would supplement but not replace existing regulatory uh, processes and authorities. And I, point, I want to also point out the reason this has to be international is as if one country, for example, we have the example in China, we have no restriction on migration across borders. And so if one country does it, it affects actually all of us uh, in the world. The committee might adopt the strict criteria um, that I outlined that the 2017 study committee um, um, uh, proposed. Um, and I, I again, uh, like this idea of only editing to sequences that are known to be common and healthy. Now, of course, a committee has no statutory authority. So how is it going to get a statutory authority? It will only come if countries actually pass laws that say it is only legal in our country to perform a heritable editing and create a pregnancy if it has been reviewed and approved by this international committee. And the committee would only approve or not after a full public disclosures with time for a public comment period, the rationale, preclinical data, including efficacy, safety, and chimerism, a review of the consent form, a review of the clinical trial design, and for specific protocols in which the committee did not have the appropriate stakeholders, of course, you would want to bring those stakeholders onto the committee as voting members, but in, as an ad hoc basis. Finally, I want to say we should never get to a point where having a children in the quote normal way is considered either unethical or frowned upon. And I think one of the dystopian futures that people have discussed is that, well, if we were doing germline editing, it would be expected that we would all do this. And that would be a tragedy in my mind. Barry Collar was on the committee, and I realize I'm one minute over. But to summarize, he said, we want healthy babies, not designer babies. And I paraphrase that a little bit to say, we want healthy humans, uh, not designer humans. And so I'll stop there and pass it over to Rosemary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matt and uh, the organizers for um, the opportunity to participate and contribute to this really important um, symposium. And I'm particularly appreciative about the opportunity to try to do this um, using communication technologies, um, all the time realizing the limits of those technologies. So um, what I'm going to do here uh, is I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation that I'll be sharing with you um, as a kind of substitute for my live presence. And um, I am garrulous. And on top of that, I also am offering some fairly counterintuitive claims and um, pieces of information. So I will make this PowerPoint available. Um, it's long to anyone who wants to take a look at it um, afterward. It's a kind of record of um, my contribution here. 
and um, I'll be moving through it, uh, maybe jumping around a little bit, which I hope is not too disconcerting, to try to respect the time that we have together and to generate uh, some important conversations in our uh, conversation period afterward. So most of the conversations and presentations about genetic editing or genetic engineering um, center uh, around, as Matt's really important presentation just did, how these technologies work and what we ought to be using these technologies for and perhaps how we ought to be regulating them. And that's a very important conversation. I'm going to offer something quite different uh, from that here by focusing instead uh, more fully on the social, the cultural, and to a certain degree the historical context and the implications of genetic engineering. Um, and so I'm hoping that what I present here will be a complement to what Matt has presented and the other parts of the conference that took place this morning that I wasn't able to participate in because of my other obligations here in Pittsburgh. So let me begin with my first slide. I want to have us together here in my time, and I'm going to try to work with 20 minutes here, maybe 25 minutes, um, with asking us to consider a paradox. So this paradox has two elements, as do all paradoxes. So the first part of this paradox is that I want to make the claim that this time now and place where we are gathered together is the best time in all of human history for people with disabilities to have a high quality of life. The second part, if we can go back one slide, to, of this paradox that relates to the first claim I'm making here is that modern liberal societies, and I'll talk more about this, this is why this is the best time for people with disabilities to have the opportunity to have a quality, high quality of life, is because modern liberal societies aspire to assure justice, equality, and inclusion for all members of the social order. So these two assertions relate to one another. So that's the first part of the paradox. The second part of the paradox is the idea, and I'll return to this paradox more fully, that modern liberal societies at the very same time are developing medical technologies for eugenic selection in the interest of procreative liberty and population health. So I want us to hold this paradox in our head together when I consider some of the points I'm going to make in the rest of my presentation. So the next slide, thank you, was a repeat of the first part of my paradox, that this is the best time in all of human history for people with disabilities to have the opportunity to flourish and to have a high quality of life. And let me give you some examples. In the next slide, for example, um, I'm showing a picture of the actor, Peter Dinklage, who is a person who lives with one of the conditions that is part of the conversation about heritable genetic engineering that we're having um, in public and in medical circles and in the kinds of conferences uh, that I'm going to and the kinds of papers that I'm reading and contributing to. And Peter Dinklage has a genetic heritable cons um, condition which we consider to be a genetic disease, and that is he has achondroplasia, which is a heritable genetic condition. 
So let me take a look at some of the other people that I want to mention who live with these conditions that are part of the conversation about heritable genetic engineering and that we are considering whether to select for or to select against. Okay, next slide. This is a picture of uh, the disability rights advocate Haben Girma, who is a woman who lives with hereditary uh, congenital deaf blindness. And I'm showing here a picture of her with President Barack Obama in 2015 when they were able to meet in Washington, D.C. for a celebration for the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, Haben Girma is the first deaf blind person, if we can imagine this, to graduate from Harvard Law School. Next, I want to show an image of a uh, person who is the first sign language using deaf road scholar, a person whose name is Rachel Kolb. She's featured here in a very short film, which is terrific if you have an opportunity to take a look at it, called Can You Read My Lips, which is about how she uses communication technologies effectively to attain a high quality of life and be integrated into the social fabric and be able to operate as the first sign language using deaf road scholar. Uh, the next slide shows a uh, picture of John Kemp, who is the president and CEO of the Viscardi Center. He is born with significant limb reduction, which is understood generally as genetic. In other words, he was born both armless and legless and uses um, a configuration of prosthetic technologies and mobility technologies in order to carry out his work in the world um, to be an attorney, and a public figure and the president and CEO of the Viscardi Center. Next slide would be an example of a woman who is a businesswoman. Her name is Kathy D. Woods. She is a pioneer of disability fashion. She has a company in which she designs and manufactures clothes for small adults. And I'm showing here a picture of her with her apparel company logo. She is an African-American woman of small stature or a small woman with a genetic condition that uh, can be identified um, in utero and genetically increasingly. Uh, one more slide to show you, to give you uh, an example. This is the comedian Maisoun Zaid in her uh, 2013 TED Talk. She is a comedian with a significant congenital disability. It's not entirely clear the um, genetic nature of her disability, but um, she advertises herself as one of the first disabled uh, sit-down, as opposed to stand-up, comedians because of her mobility impairment. And finally, I wanted to share an image of an older person who has um, achieved quite a high quality of life. This is perhaps the most well-known philosopher in the world, Jürgen Habermas, a German philosopher born in the late 1930s in um, Germany. Um, who was born with a cleft palate, which is not understood, of course, entirely now as a genetic condition, although we're discovering new genetic diseases, of course, uh, every day, and we're not entirely sure what a variety of genetic conditions um, are produced by genetically, but Habermas writes in his acceptance speech for the Kyoto Prize the way that growing up at the time that he grew up with a cleft palate and enduring many corrective surgeries when he was young for the cleft palate that he was born with as a congenital disability actually shaped his work as a philosopher of public communication and as a philosopher, and that he would not have done this work in his life had he not had the experience of being born with and living with a cleft palate. 
So I want to go on to the next part of my assertion here, and that is that modern liberal societies, this is part of my paradox, aspire to assure justice, equality, and inclusion for all members of the social order. And I'm going to introduce here a bit of history to talk to you a little bit about the uh, human and civil rights movements that begin in 1948 and continue through 2017 and beyond. Um, and this is a bit of a history of this development of bioethics and its concurrent development of the human and civil rights movements. So next slide, please. I'm going to begin with a quote from Hannah Arendt, the philosopher who wrote in Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil in 1963, that she believed political regimes ought not to determine, and this is a very famous quote, who should and who should not inhabit the world. And this concept is the concept that forms a set of covenants, which, which, which is what I call them, that is to say declarations, treaties, covenants, laws, policies that constitute the civil and human rights movement, which I think, and uh, my history is, that it begins in 1948 with, next slide, the universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I'm showing here an image of Eleanor Roosevelt holding this Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and I'm going to quote from that declaration in the next slide, and that is, again, in 1948, and I'm quoting directly, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and this summarizes the impulse behind the civil and human rights movements that swept in the mid-20th century all of liberal social orders. Um, another quote directly from the Declaration, Universal Direction Declaration of Human Rights talks about uh, very often the dignity and the worth of the human person. And so this sense of human rights, this sense of human equality and dignity and equal rights inspires the human and civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. And a part of this, of course, is, next slide, the disability rights movement. And I'm showing here an image of the disability rights movement. Um, we have a protest here with a number of wheelchair using people with disabilities who are disability rights advocates who are protesting in the mid-1970s and early 1980s and even in the 19, late 1960s for an accessible built environment and for equal rights and access for people with disabilities. And the banner here that's being held up um, shows the interrelation of these rights movements by quoting Martin Luther King, who says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So the disability rights movement gives us the legislation and the treaties that we have in place in the mid 20th century and later than mid 20th century, and that is, next slide, primarily in the United States, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA of, the 1990, of 1990, and again, there's an amended ADA of 2009, which assures that people with disabilities in the United States will have equal access and the means to protest against and take legal action against discrimination and the legal capacity to request accommodations. So that's what the Americans with Disabilities Act does and aspires to do. And of course, all justice legislation is aspirational. So there's a gap between the aspiration and the realization of the Americans with Disabilities Act, but nonetheless, it is in place 
to transform the society and to make this time and this place the best time for people with disabilities to flourish, uh, certainly in liberal democracies. Um, another, of course, one of these implements or treaties, next slide, is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, enacted in 2006. The United States has not signed on to this treaty because it has the Americans with Disabilities Act, but many other countries around the world have signed on to this treaty, which is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, we have a uh, concomitant with the disability rights movement. We also have what I call knowledge development about disability rights and disability culture. And the next slide gives you an example of this. This is the uh, deaf bioethicist, Jackie Leach Scully, who is English, working now in Melbourne, Australia, who has written one of the first and most important books in the knowledge development about disability bioethics, and this is called Disability Bioethics, Moral Bodies and Moral Differences. So we have not just treaties, but other knowledge uh, documents, if you will, that help bring forward the um, context that makes it possible for people with disabilities to flourish most fully right now in this place and in this time. So I want to talk uh, for a moment, and I have a lot of the things I want to say on slides so that you can have access to them later if you'd like to. This is a rather dense presentation. So next slide. I want to assert that human rights covenants, and this is, of course, a summary of what I've been saying in the presentation I've been making so far, carry out the principle of active accommodation that is fundamental to the disability rights movement. And those principles of active accommodation are change the environment, not the person, protect rather than regularize, abide rather than improve, and accommodate rather than eliminate. So this is my summary of the work of the disability rights movements and its covenants and their enactment. Okay, next slide. If we are to enact the work of these covenants effectively and when we do that in our social order, these disability rights covenants that I've very quickly summarized here for you will strengthen support for disability culture, for the presence of people with disabilities, and for awareness about disability inclusion and justice across all civic institutions. Another way of saying this, next slide, would be that implementing these disability rights covenants does four things, does many things, but I want to enumerate the four things that it can do. One is to change attitudes. Another one is to increase access. A third is to build community. And the fourth is to cultivate leadership. And I've given you some examples of some of the leaders, people with disabilities, leading the way in public culture. Um, for people with disabilities to enter into public life and to flourish most fully. Um, I want to spend just a few more minutes, and we'll move on a little bit quickly. If we can move from, next slide, and I'm not gonna talk about that to get to the next slide, because I want to talk about the second part of this paradox a little bit, and that is that at the same time that this flourishing of people with disabilities is possible now in a way that it never has been in all of human history, we are developing in modern liberal societies medical technologies for eugenic selection against conditions that we consider to be disabilities in the interest of procreative liberty 
and population health. And this is where genetic engineering comes in. Let me offer a definition of eugenics here, which is the practice and the ideology of shaping a particular human community according to the values of that community by controlling who reproduces, how they reproduce, and what they reproduce. So I want to suggest that genetic engineering is part of a pattern of eugenic technologies that are reducing human variation. I'm going to skip over some of the history of negative eugenics that I've included here. People can take a look at that a little bit later. I was going to talk a bit about the old eugenics, uh, eugenics being imagined as the self-direction of human evolution. We'll move through the next slide, the next one, into what is sometimes called the new eugenics, which is generally understood as liberal eugenics. Let me offer a definition of liberal eugenics. So liberal eugenics is a contemporary conversation among philosophers and bioethicists that debates conflicting liberty interests. And it makes a moral argument asserting that reproductive autonomy should include both the obligation and the right to select against bringing disabled children into the world. So this is a definition of the conversation that is known as liberal eugenics. And let me give you an example of um, liberal eugenics that comes from one of its uh, major philosophers. Next slide. Next slide. Whoops, I'm sorry. Go back one. Thank you. So this is a quote from the philosopher at Oxford University, Julian Savalescu, um, who has put forward a concept called procreative beneficence, in which Savalescu uh, argues that parents um, in liberal societies have the moral obligation to create children with the best chance of the best life. And Savalescu goes on to argue, next slide, that couples should select embryos or fetuses which are most likely to have the best life based on available genetic information, including information about non-disease genes. So what Savalescu is doing here with procreative beneficence is endorsing um, what we call enhancement, uh, genetics to be used for enhancement in order to provide future persons with the most advantageous traits to have the best life. So this is the concept of liberal eugenics. And I want to move on to one more slide, a couple of slides down, to um, talk a little bit about reproductive selection technology in practice. Now, genetic editing is only one element of the practice of liberal eugenics in the reproductive environment. And I want to simply suggest uh, several of these practices. And then I'm going to end there so we can um, talk about other kinds of things. But just to give you a list here uh, of where these reproductive selection and technology practices occur. Uh, in genetic counseling, genetic editing, selective genetic testing and screening, embryo screening, imaging technology screening, prenatal fetal diagnosis and prognosis, prenatal information delivery and framing, and withholding newborn care and sustenance. Now, whether we agree with these technologies or the use of them or not is really not what I'm bringing forward. I'm being descriptive here in saying that these are technologies that are in play now that have the effect of what uh, liberal eugenics is carrying out. So 
I will end with one slide, which makes the argument that I would like to leave you with, and that is the effect of these multi-stage eugenic selection practices is to increasingly standardize modern liberal communities by reducing human biological and social diversity, and along with it, social tolerance for people with disabilities. So I'll end there. There's lots more. If you would like to have access to the um, PowerPoint presentation, thank you very much. And I'm happy to participate in the conversation. Wow. Thank you, Rosemary. I think that talk just raised a whole bunch of questions for us. Um, <laughs> It sure does. <laughs> no, it's fabulous. Um, so I guess I want to push on your very last claim. And first of all, say that seems to be as an empirical claim as much as a normative claim. And as an empirical claim, is it consistent with your observation that at the same time we've been developing these technologies, it is also the best time to be alive as a person with a disability, at least in this country. Um, because I, I suppose one could make the argument that, in fact, um, perhaps something like allowing parents to have this kind of reproductive liberty results in people um, making choices to have the children they want, and the people who make the choices to have the children with Down syndrome or other conditions um, that they could have screened for but chose not to, um, really invest a lot in those children and work to ensure that those children have a very good life and those children are in our society, um, adding to the diversity and richness of the society. So I just want to push on your very final claim there. Um. When I make the claim that this is the best time at this very moment to live in modern liberal social orders, um, if you are a person with um, a disability, um, I don't think it conflicts with the um, premise that we're reducing human, well, not the, pre the premise, the, uh, the reality that we're reducing human variation at the exact same time. Take Down syndrome, for example. Um, people born uh, over the last several years with Down syndrome have the uh, best opportunities for education, for employment, for a high quality of life, better than any other time that um, such people have been born into the world. And it is also exactly at the same time when, um, and the statistics vary a little bit on this, that um, worldwide and certainly in the United States, we are reducing that population by up to 90%. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Did you have any? No, I, I, I think one of the key statements when you were describing liberal eugenics was um, the, I think the, I'd like you to just explore a little bit more about giving couples the opportunity not to have a child with this, a disability versus the obligation to have a child without a disability because I think that really gets at the heart of the matter whether you um, have a liberal society in which there's a freedom of choice or whether exactly. you have a liberal society that is obligating you to do something that you wouldn't normally do. And I actually, my last statement was saying that it, it, we should not ever feel like you should be obligated to have a child in an artificial way. So this doesn't yes. mean obligation um, and, and choice and, or, or opportunity. Uh, this is one of the um, it, really crucial points here uh, about liberal eugenics as uh, Julian Salvescu and several other um, utilitarian philosophers and thinkers. Sometimes um, there are uh, 
other terms, transhumanist, for right. example, who, uh, I mean, Savinescu makes the, the boldest claim mm -hmm. by um, saying that parents have a moral obligation right. as opposed to an opportunity. So he's putting pressure on the uh, possibilities for procreative choice or procreative liberty um, in order to make a moral argument that we ought to have the best persons. So that's why I like to quote that, because um, there is, of course, a fine distinction between what we might think of as free choice and a kind of overdetermined choice, which exists in the reproductive environment. And the overdetermination um, of this free choice is created in part by the series of conditions that we have decided to test for with the potential to select against. Can I, 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 as, you're, as I've been thinking about what you're saying, I, I'm reflecting on my own training and practice as a pediatric oncologist, which is we have families who come, who come in with a child who's diagnosed with a, a cancer for which uh, there is known therapy, but it's not guaranteed to cure their child of therapy. And if the parents refuse chemotherapy, in the US at least, there is, uh, there can be the court ordered forcing of the removal of the child and, and the chemotherapy Absolutely. administered. So is, do you disagree with that? Or why is it okay to force a family to have chemotherapy for cancer, but not okay to force, I, first of all, I agree that we should not force couples to have an obligation, I, I'm with you. But I'm wondering how you make the distinction between postnatal pr provision of optimal care versus a prenatal, what you're calling liberal eugenics? Um, Was that a reasonable question? It, the problem, the ethical problem, is the expansion of what we consider to be, uh, of the human variations that we are now considering to be disease categories. So take something like Down syndrome or achondroplasia. These are understood as diseases. These are understood as negative health conditions that can be uh, tested for uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, they are also conditions that people can live with and that people do live with um, and that live flourishing lives with these conditions. So when you identify such a wide variety of human variations as disease, and when you have a very narrow understanding of what we think of as health and healthy and a healthy baby, you are establishing uh, sets of criteria that influence the kinds of choices that people make in exercising procreative liberty in the reproductive environment. I would, uh, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I would like to change just a little bit and direct a question to you, which is, um, so you set forth the criteria that the National Academy Committee had specified for when it might be acceptable to go forward with uh, germline gene editing or heritable gene yeah. editing. Um, and those criteria seem uh, very, it's a very, very high bar. And I wanted to put that uh, in conversation with the comment that uh, Dr. Bonham had on one of his slides from one of his patients yep. uh, that he interviewed, the person who said, well, if you can do somatic cell editing, 
to take care of sickle cell, why would you let more people be born with this? Why wouldn't you just do editing that would prevent this from happening to people in the future? Um, and so I just, I wanted to put that in conversation. Well, I think that, that quotes, uh, uh, Vince is using that for a very particular reason because it's challenging a lot of us to think about just that issue. Um, and and I'll, I'll add to that as well, which is the argument, well, wouldn't it be much easier just to modify you know, something at a one cell stage than try to modify an entire body or even an entire organ system like the blood. So there's a technical argument that people will make as well. Um, and I think uh, the broad public discussion with a broad range of stakeholders is about whether crossing that boundary of modifying genes that will be passed on future generations, which I do believe is something that is a, is a, bound, is a line, um, is it worth crossing that line um, for that purpose when the, 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 the characteristic, I'll call it a disease, um, it, it could be treated in other ways. Um, I'll just uh, reflect on what Rosemary seen. Uh, Rosemary is saying is that disease always affects the shape of that person. Um, but I don't think that mitigates uh, giving the opportunity of that person to cure themselves of the disease. Just because somebody uh, is shaped by their disease does not mean we have to enforce that they live with that disease. And I, you're nodding your head, so you clearly agree. But I think this is an important thing to bring out. Mm -hmm. um, where I think we might get to is, is one of the things that has come up uh, today, and, and I think a, a lot of people have thought about, is this concept of risk benefit. So would you use a first in human therapy for something that had an alternative? Probably not. If you, would you use first in human therapy f in a couple that this was their only way, and they chose to do it, they weren't obligated to do this, to have a, a genetically related child uh, a healthy genet or healthy genetically related child. Supposing um, t 30 years or 50 years, there's now been 100 or 200 uh, uh, people brought into this world that way, and it was shown to be safe and effective. Now, does the risk benefit change? And you start to say, well, you're right. Maybe we should do this for sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. um, then we get into the issue, of course, of, of I think it was implied in the question about malaria, is a lot of these variants do exist in the human population because they confer protection against certain environmental conditions. And we would have to continue to really get even more knowledgeable about uh, human genetic environment, uh, social environment interactions. So I think it, it's now time uh, to invite the audience up for questions. Okay. Great, Jonathan. So um, I'm just interested in this demarcation problem. Um, so clearly conditions like deafness, chondroplasia. Excuse me, would it be possible for people to say their names? Sure, yeah, Jonathan Kimmelman, Mount McGill University. Um, so I'm interested in this demarcation issue. Uh, clearly one can look at conditions like Down syndrome, achondroplasia, deafness, as uh, not necessarily disabilities, uh, but as actually affirmative aspects mm -hmm. of human flourishing. Um, there's another category of biological phenomena that humans encounter that are clearly in the pathological state that have practically nothing affirming about them, Canavan disease, Huntington's, et cetera. And I guess what I'm sort of wondering, I, I sort of want to hear what you have to say about whether I'm misconstruing this. Like, to me, I'm thinking about this as a demarcation issue. You have some conditions yeah. that are just kind of, you know, categorically pathological and mm -hmm. others that aren't. Am I wrong to think of this as a demarcation issue? Or if it is a demarcation issue, tell me more about how we draw the boundary around the conditions that are part of human flourishing. They're just different, and we haven't built societies around recognizing yeah. that flourishing versus conditions that are just scourges. Yeah. Maybe I'll take a first shot, and Rosemary, you can do s second. Absolutely, you're talking about what another person, another way of framing that is, is, is uh, well, I, I hate to use the term slippery slope, but you know, what's, what's disease and what's trait? Um, that's 
I'll tell you who, what you don't want is you don't want me deciding, and you probably don't want you deciding. <laughs> Uh, that's why I propose that the decision should be made by an enormous group of people, including the patient, uh, maybe, I won't, we won't call them patients, people and family members with that condition. And I think that the um, one way of thinking about it is, say, deafness. Some families feel like that defines them as a person and they want to have children with deafness. Other families feel like that's not something they want to have children for. So I think that the, my, my answer would be twofold. One is, is that it's not me to decide that. It's the, the, the families and communities with the disease that weigh in. But then I would say, and there should never be an obligation, but I think there should be an opportunity. Rosemary? Thank you. Um, this, of course, is a really important question. Yeah. and. Um, in laying out my description of eugenics and liberal eugenics and uh, the practice of liberal eugenics in the interest of reproductive uh, liberty, um, I don't want to make an argument that we should outlaw these uh, practices or to oversimplify in any way. Um, the important development of medical technologies and genetic editing is only one medical technology that will help human beings have better lives and flourish. Um, I want to point out that it's, well, complicated. Um, one good example, well, let me, let me bring up two examples. So one example is Huntington's. So, the conversation about genetic editing often turns to what kinds of conditions should we work to eliminate with uh, heritable uh, genetic editing now. And one of the nominations is always Huntington's. Um, and I work quite closely with the historian Alice Wexler who um, has researched and written about Huntington's. And Alice says that if you ask people who have Huntington's in their family, her thinking is that overwhelmingly, these people would say Huntington's is an absolute scourge that ought to be eliminated from the human condition for once and for all. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's also a complexity to this. Um, one complexity is that there is a treatment being developed now that is in trials for um, Huntington's that may be successful. So that's one thing to think about. Huntington's is a very late onset uh, genetic condition. Uh, Lots of things can happen uh, between um, conception and the onset of Huntington's. Huntington's can manifest in a variety of different ways, even though it is um, a genetic condition that if you have the gene for it, you will develop the disease, or at least that's the understanding of it now. But what's most interesting is that uh, for about 20 years, we've been able to identify the gene for Huntington so that people can, if they suspect Huntington's is in their family, they can have the genetic test and find out whether they carry the gene for Huntington's. And what has happened is only about 20% of people who may have Huntington's in their family have actually taken the test. Right. And this says something about how we understand ourselves as people with genetic, specific genetic identities and how we understand ourselves as navigating lives in relation to our genetic profiles. I'm not sure, nor is Alice Wexler, what this says, but it's something worth noting. This conflict that is apparent between the number of people that actually want to find out 
whether they have the genes for Huntington's. And the idea that Huntington's might be edited out of the human condition. Those are not necessarily uh, contradictory situations, but rather they're instructive for us to think more clearly about how we understand ourselves um, as human beings with genetic complexities and genetic identities. Thank, thank you, Rosemary. Um, we have a line of people yeah. who are waiting to talk to you. So um, next, please. So I actually have a question. Um, from Matt, about the last slide, the sort of the Jigundo committee that's uh, <laughs> the international committee that's going to solve all these problems and then get all their countries to sign on to them, yeah. pass laws. Oh, uh, <laughs> by the way, I'm Jennifer Hochschild. I'm sorry, I'm a, a political scientist in the government department at Harvard. So I'm yeah. going to ask about the politics of this, uh -huh. um, not surprisingly, which is uh, who sets up such a committee? How, how does this happen? I mean, that's not your job to answer, of course, but how, the, the broader question that this evokes for me is. There are a lot of people in this room, probably including myself, who think that scientists have some responsibility, more or less, but more than zero, to engage seriously and importantly in the public arena. Yep. And other people who say, well, no, actually, scientists have a distinctive comparative advantage, and it's not the public arena. That's the job of people who teach politics or, or whatever. So, so how, I mean, so the particular question is about your Jaigundo committee, which sounds <laughs> wonderful. The broader question is kind of how do we get from here to there, but in particular, what, how do we think about the role of scientists, clinicians, frontline people? Yeah. How much responsibility should they have to take and how much of it is just not their job? All right, could I just say, let's let Matt answer that question and try and keep our questions short and remember that if we don't get a chance to answer everything, there's another panel after this that maybe yeah. can take on some of these questions. But I think I, I'll, I'll give a, sh a very short answer to that, which is I absolutely think scientists have an obligation to participate in the evaluation and interpretation of the science we do. Um, but we don't have the only, we're not the only voice in the conversation. And I think the fact that uh, we have many people today, many scientists uh, participating today shows many of us agree. I also think that some scientists are terrible at it, and they probably shouldn't participate. Um, and just like I probably shouldn't, I sh should not be a politician. Um, you know, so who should make this committee? Again, I, as you said, I don't have to decide uh, this, fortunately. But I, I, I hope that the two committees that were discussed earlier, the um, National Academy Committee with the Royal uh, Society Committee, as well as the WHO Committee, may come to the conclusion that this committee I propose it needs to be formed, and then I think it would be something like the WHO or the UN that would uh, uh, make this sort of committee. And we know how well that worked with climate change, so I understand <laughs> all the weaknesses uh, with such committees, yeah. Let me say that um, there is a uh, international bioethics committee I've yeah. learned recently that is constituted and run by UNESCO yeah. uh, that uh, exists, it's an international bioethics committee. Um, and I was just at a meeting in Geneva about disability bioethics. Um, and it was interesting because several members of this committee were present at the, at the meeting, the conference, and um, they were very eager to talk about disability bioethics, but several of them said that they didn't know anything about disability or disability rights. So one of the things that would be important is to have a broad representation or an, a kind of educational uh, component for this committee mm -hmm. to bring forward um, perspectives and histories and knowledge bases outside of medical science and medical technology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on this committee. Thank, thank you. That is absolutely, I, I totally agree. I think we, all, know, agree. we all agree. Yeah. Yep. Next. Uh, Ricardo Cortez, the Instituto Politecnico Nacional. Uh, this question is for Matthew. Okay. Uh, under the technical criteria that you were listed as far as uh, you know, allowing uh, this type of technologies to be applied, you said as it is restricted to serious diseases or conditions. 
But when you see that the, there is about, I don't know, 30 million uh, rare diseases in the world and 80% of those are genetic, is that maybe just too broad uh, of a restriction? Uh, the question is, is, uh, the, is the restriction too broad? Well, I, it goes, I think, a bit to what Pilar asked me earlier is, um, why not for sickle cell disease? And, and I, would, I, I guess I would answer your question is, is start strict if things are safe and effective and there is global consensus, then expand to more and more conditions. But I think in 2019, I, I would rather err on being strict rather than being loose. My opinion, right? Next. Hi, my name is Amy Steiner, and I guess my question comes from both being a clinician as well as a parent of a child with a disability. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, or a couple of the factors that struck me in the presentation related to people with disabilities um, that weren't really highlighted um, was one, geography plays an important part in your ability to be successful with a right. disability. Um, we actually moved 3,000 miles to get access to appropriate care for a child with Asperger's, high functioning here today because he has an interest in gene editing. Um, so I do hear the part about the, there's ability for them to have thriving lives, um, but at the same time, I think geography plays an important part in access to care. Socioeconomics is also an incredibly important part. I spend about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year out of pocket. Yep just so he can get the therapies that aren't covered by insurance. Right. Um, and then to your point about Down syndrome, there, there are varying degrees of disability and physical suffering that come with many of these different types of genetic um, disabilities. And so while one may be incredibly high functioning, another one may be very catastrophic, um, bed sores, infections, chronic uh, you know, ventilator use, and so forth. And so one of my questions is, um, related to the covenants that were established, in what year were those established? Was that before a lot of this type of technology and discussion had started um, related to uh, gen gene editing? And then my other question is, who should carry the responsibility of making sure that other children have access to the same things my son did? Um, I'd like to address that um, yeah, <clears throat> because one of the most important um, Parts of this conversation has to do with distribution of resources and just distribution of resources. So when I offer the real provocation that right now, right here, <laughs> perhaps in Cambridge, uh, people with disabilities have the best opportunity for the highest quality of life ever in all of human history. That provocation is based on access to resources. Um, and part of the conversation about the use of these medical technologies needs to focus on resource distribution. The amount of money that goes into the development of medical technologies to eliminate disability and people with disabilities could be redirected to increase and support the quality of life of people with disabilities, children with disabilities, people with disabilities throughout the life course in important and just ways. In regard to the, the physical degree of physical suffering or, or potential physical suffering as a result of a, a disability? I think this is a complicated question because it is ethically inappropriate for anyone to evaluate the suffering of anyone else. Um, and we have had these conversations uh, more fully around the um, politics and ethics of aid in dying. Um, 
but to assess in advance um, what kind of suffering someone may uh, occasion in a life um, is, I think, um, actually unethical for us to do in the same way that it is basically unethical for us to, um, as, a, as a community, um, impose the preferences of some people on uh, future persons. Uh, and yet, of course, that's the responsibility, the parental obligation, and the obligation that we have as a community to ensure and provide health for, uh, for everyone and for future persons. So I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a paradox here. I'm talking about a conflict of ethical imperatives that we want to re be able to really think about quite clearly. Hi, I'm David Risen. Here's my question. It's uh, directed to Professor Garland Thompson. As a physician and the father of an institutionalized adult with severe autism who is intellectually very compromised, I could not fail to notice what I thought was a certain selection bias in the group of disabled adults you showed us, all of whom were of normal or above average intelligence and who are functioning in the world. Could you comment? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, a great deal of very interesting work has been done about um, or around family members with what we consider to be significant or severe disabilities. Um, some of that work is done by the philosopher Eva Kate, who has a daughter um, who, whose um, capacities and uh, um, life might be somewhat parallel to your son. Uh, that is to say, uh, Eve's daughter has lived in an institution and thrives in an institution her whole life. Um, and um, she could be understood as having a severe cognitive impairment of some sort. Uh, and Eva Kate's entire work as a philosopher has been to make the argument that her daughter and people like her daughter can have a high quality of life and can and often are loved and appreciated as family members. And to, to bring forward these stories. There are many of them in memoir written by people with disabilities who have family members, children with significant uh, disabilities, who love and appreciate uh, these children and want them as members of their families as they are. As counterintuitive as that may seem to many of us, uh, these are the narratives that are brought forward that we need to pay some attention to. Can, can I can I just make one comment to end? Of and course. Just done, which is, you know, and and I think Rosemary, you would have you should have said this, which is I'm sorry to hear about your son. Um, it sounds like, you know, while he can have a high quality of life as you just uh, argued, I think that. Reducing suffering in this world is all of our goals. And if you believe your son is suffering, then I think it's up to us as physicians and scientists in the society to find ways to minimize that suffering. And that's what the conversation is about without, okay, without labeling human beings who are alive as somehow less worthy. So that's the balance we're looking for. I wanted to add one thing. Yeah. I think that um, 
the suffering and toll taken on his mother, on me, yep. and on his siblings is also part of the equation. Absolutely. Because enough. of the enormous demands placed on a family system by a child uh, who is born this way. Yeah, I agree, and, and I, 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 I call that the echo of the disease because it really echoes through even more than just your family. I am sure, sure it uh, echoes broad, and, and that's also what we want to improve. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you, Pilar, Matthew, and Rosemary. Um, to say that was a very powerful session is an understatement, and not surprisingly, as someone said today, the technical we can do, we can work around the technical, but this is where um, the challenge lies. And uh, we will take a 15-minute break, and please come back because Sharon Begley will have all the moderators back, and we'll, we will reflect on all the sessions today.